Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Each week I say I'm gonna do a better job <laughs> putting the word out there, and I never do. It seems like a, you know, you come in and if you just get whacked 100 points or whatever it was this morning, and you kind of forget about uh, these other things in there. But I uh, appreciate you guys and girls showing up tonight. If you register once at DaveLandry.com slash webinar, you should be registered for all. So obviously everybody here has already registered. You don't have to register again. But uh, if you do, if you would like to attend this show live, love to have you here. The more the merrier. It makes for a much better show. The more participation I get from you guys and girls. Go to dailyarcom slash webinar. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions. I'll have a plethora of things to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. And what we'll do is I'll lecture for a little while here and then we'll jump into crypto and then we'll jump into stocks. So what are we can talk about? Well, last week I was at Charcon. So I figured last week at Charcon would be a good thing to talk about. Now, the way Charcon worked was I went into a segment or a QA or whatever the or bull bear debate or uh, my presentation, whatever the case may be. And then wasn't able to see all the other presentations especially while I was doing one but they did have a big screen TV and we kind of hung out in the cafeteria and watched everybody at bits and pieces bits and pieces but we got to talking at all so anyway long story endless uh they haven't sent me the recordings yet but once I get the recordings and go through those I'll see if I can flesh out some of these concepts and see if there's anything that I that I missed but the, my biggest takeaway was kind of hanging out with the guys and gals and that was pretty cool and you, you pick up a lot from from that, it was really, really nice. Um, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't one of those events where I get to talk to you guys and, and get a, a sense for what you're doing and right and what you're doing wrong, and et cetera. It was uh, just a, a bunch of, uh, I guess, pros you would call them at, at there. But uh, that was kind of fun too, and that's kind of like more of a pinch me moment type of thing. Uh, you know, wow, I can't believe I'm here. You know, there's uh, Ralph Acapora, there's Martin Pring, and you know, I'll try not to name drop too much, but it was pretty amazing. Anyway, I want to talk a little bit about intraday VIX trading. I did get the fire off of VIX trade. That's one thing that I'm kind of trying to work on, and I got to be careful not to do not to do too many because I don't want to just trade to be trading. But we talked about, or we've been talking about the VIX on and off quite a bit. And what I want to show you is is a potential to trade it in intraday, and it's something I've been, really been working on. And that'll make a little more sense in a minute. And, and believe me, I'm not going to blow you away today. And I'm going to explain why. I want to talk a little bit about burning dogs. Burning dogs is when you have an opening gap reversal and something in a downtrend makes new lows and then begins to reverse. And that'll make a lot more sense in one minute. There's the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that from Greg Morris. <laughs> He was sitting next to me in a presentation. He said, all predictions are about the future. <laughs> it was funny. Anyway, that, those weren't his exact words, but all right, let's shift gears. Let's talk about the VIX real quick. I want to go through a few trades or at least one trade in the VIX, talk a little bit about the VIX, hop into the last week at Dan Camp, and then uh, talk about burning dog. So let's talk about the VIX. This is not nearly as complicated as it looks. This is the VIX. This is a 10-day simple moving average. This is the S&P 500 overlaid, closing basis, obviously, so you can see what's happening. And the middle is the close, the open, and the high distance from the moving average. And the idea with the VIX is wait for it to get stretched away and look to play it. If it gets stretched to the upside, look to buy the market or short the VIX. If we can stretch to the downside, look to short the market or buy the VIX. And I hope I said from the on the upside, stretching upside, look to short the VIX. Like right here at stretch, you see it imploded a little bit. The real money is in the asymmetrical moves to the upside as opposed to the implosion of the VIX. So the explosion of volatility, everybody just panics and freaks out which we didn't really get this morning, but the VIX is so high now, maybe that's why. And that was a little shocking to me, or surprising, I should say. Nothing shocks me too much in the markets anyway. 
But anyway, down here is the range. And as I've said in prior, it's just a high minus low based on the average true range, going back one day for the average true range, and today's high minus low. And ideally, you don't want to hop in until this range begins to expand a little bit, maybe past 50. And in some cases, if you're looking for an explosion in the VIX, maybe past 100. I know I talked about these things, so I'm trying to just rush through them now. And anyway, the middle chart is, you can see these highs here. And down here, you can see this is a 10%. 10% is a good round number when I did my VIX systems, which were inspired by a lot of Lenny, Larry, Lenny, Larry Connor's research way back in the mid 90s. I found that 10% was a good round number for reversions of the mean type of moves with the VIX and a similar move, similar moves in the S&P 500. Anyway, so I'm just measuring the range on the bottom. And again, the asymmetrical move is going to typically be to the upside. You can see right here, it's 250% or more of its normal range. Notice is a big VIX beginning to take off, market beginning to implode. And just real quick, just to get everybody up to speed, because I know everyone's not here every week. My original VIX research, you held over several days, and I went back and looked at that stuff, dusted it off a while back, and absolutely printed money until this little thing called the pandemic happened. And you get heavily long or heavily short coming into something like that. And you get creamed. And, and I learned my lesson early on trading this and holding overnight by having a lot of S&P futures on and then coming in and getting creamed and on. So that's that's just a, an anomaly of short term systems. I think if you're a pure short term player, you're going to run into some troubles because your risk are so great overnight. Now, but Dave, aren't you a position trader? I am. But if I'm up 500 percent and something gets whacked and I only get out up 400%, then I'm doing pretty good. Or even if I get whacked on something else, as long as I could occasionally catch that outlier, I'm gonna do okay. So basically, again, getting back to the VIX, we're just looking forward to get stretched, we're looking for reversions to the main move. And you can see that happened a little bit today. So we were right around 10% or so, and it kind of imploded a little bit. But to my surprise, it didn't implode a lot. And as you can see here, at one second, I had a little VIX trade on, and I did it across multiple accounts, but I'm not going to knock your socks off. But again, the, the shorting of the VIX isn't really where the money is. It's going long of the VIX. And that's why I know I'm a nerd, <laughs> but that's why I'm so excited about this research that I think that next time we get the, the market uh, beginning to implode after it's been complacent for a while, we get that 600% on a relative basis move in the VIX where the VIX goes from, let's say the UVXY, and I don't know where it was back when it did, I think it was like 20 or something. UVXY, let's say it goes from 20 to 60. That's real money. And even if you just had 100 shares or something like that, you make like $4,000 on such a crazy move. And of course, you want to scale out a little bit along the way. And I'll show you that in one second. Anyway, so hopefully this makes sense. I know I rushed through it, but I will be recapping this and go in and watch the last few chart shows and then go way back in time or maybe three months, four months or a year ago when I first got hot on this VIX again, the VIX fever uh, shows. So here's what the VIX look like today. This is the SVXY, and the market, as you know, kind of imploded on the open, or more than kind of imploded on the open, but it began to stabilize and back and fill and back and fill. Now, I didn't want to just jump in, so I ended up putting an order in well above that opening range, and I only put an order in for 100 shares, and I did do this across multiple accounts, but I wasn't really committed to piling into the VIX. I was more interested in trading some ETFs like SoxL did pretty good in that today and, and LabU did pretty good in that too. And we can look at those when we get to the live charts. Now, as I'm putting together my slides and throwing some of these trades in last minute, I'm thinking I'm gonna come across like, hey, everything's been great lately. No, everything has not been great lately. It's been really tough with this intraday stuff. And I reach a point where I'm just learning to sit on my hands more and more. And you got to be careful not to do too much. And as I preach robbing a line or stealing a line from Jimmy Rogers from the first market wizards is I just wait until his money lie in the corner. And all I do is walk up there and pick it up. Well, I've been guilty of not doing that a lot lately, trying to make something happen. And it's kind of that, but it was working so well. The five most dangerous words on Wall Street. I better count those because... <laughs> 
someone just got called out on on counting say but it was working so well six words i think but it was working so well six words all right six six most dangerous words on wall street and i've actually done some writing on that recently and my intraday stuff which is not my main focus and not my core and that's why i call the method of the trading service my core methodology but i have been doing a little bit too much of that intraday stuff and i can tell when i'm doing that not only because my equity is headed lower because i'm kind of grinding away all those nice profits i've earned over months and months and months with the core trading but my back begins to hurt now soros once said and there's been other famous people that that talk about these ailments but lately my back uh, my left side of my back is where i get the pain and then it's actually causing uh it might be pinching a nerve or something i've got some tingling happening in my hands like okay dave you better back off because the equity has gone down because the volatility has been just crazy you've had these broadening formations during the day where the market makes both new highs and both and also makes new lows and the whipsaw has been frustrating you look at the market the market at the end of the day you're thinking oh man i could have just got in held on all day and exited by the close and made a lot of money well it, it hasn't been that straight route higher even on the downside so it's just been from my perspective it's been pretty brutal now one thing i woke up and wrote about recently is a saying we have in the south the sun doesn't shine in the same dog's ass every day so i would imagine these oscillator traders are in heaven now don't rush out and start trading oscillators because guess what the market might start trending again years ago as i said at nauseam and i would never throw anybody under the bus but i knew a trader and he was a trend trader or seemed like he was a trend trader and the market had this big fat reversal and i said hey you know did you get cream today oh no i i played that reversal it's like oh okay you know and no matter what the market did that's the kind of trading he was doing and trust me, nobody is that good. I guarantee you, you end up chasing your own tail. So what I would encourage you to do, getting back to like to the core stuff, I'd encourage you to do that first and foremost before looking at this intraday stuff. And you know, I'm here anyway, and if I see some kind of opportunity, I just gotta remind myself to wait until that money's lying in the corner and walk over and pick it up, as opposed to in and out, in and out, in and out, like the, like the rat going for the cocaine. And, and one of the guys there, said he says you know dave one time you said i'm not going to make any trades today and that really stuck with me and it's like oh i got to remind myself of that and uh so last couple of days i've been trying not to make any trades until i absolutely couldn't stand it and maybe that's why the entry on this svxy is a little bit higher but anyway be careful not to change methodologies you're better off finding something longer term and sticking with it like the core methodology the swing to intermediate term trading and when things aren't fantastic just become more and more selective wait for those setups wait for those setups and then once you get them wait for entries wait for entries and i've probably been boring you to death with the trading service lately because we hadn't had a whole lot of setups and then i think two or three that we did have recently none of them triggers and triggered and we got another one going into tomorrow we'll see what happens if it implodes we're not going to take it now i know i kind of went all the way around <laughs> on that but it looks like i struck a few cards here with, with a couple of you guys and sometimes you need to hear these things and somebody told me once that uh you know dave i really don't get a lot out of your, your teachings and i'm like oh really he goes yeah but when you go in those rants I, I i sometimes get something out of it so that kind of like thanks i think so it did kind of give me license to rant anyway so i didn't set the world on fire as you can see with this trade 100 shares you know big deal I kind of wanted to establish a position because I was like, oh, I'm gonna put an alert on this. It's like, you know what, Dave? It looks good enough to where you could put in an order. But like I said, the volatility just didn't seem to be coming off like it should today. And that's something I can't really teach, but it, maybe I can. If you look at the VIX up in the 30s or whatever, and the market begins to rally, the market's like, you know what? I don't trust you just yet. And maybe there's a lesson, maybe there's a lesson in that in and of itself. Maybe the VIX has to start coming off for the market to rally. I'd be interested in knowing if any of you guys want to take that ball and run with it and do a little research. And, you know, maybe there's something there. And that's why I love to teach so much is because a lot of stuff comes out in the teaching. And I learn a lot myself from a selfish perspective. 
And also, like the trading service, it forces me to do my homework. Maybe I should fill it not so much next time, Dave. So there's a period down there. You know, I just put on 100 shares again, as opposed to putting an alert in so I can get an alert and see what's going on. It's like, yeah, you know, buy 100 shares, see what happens. And I trailed the stop. I think I trailed like a one point stop on this. I knew if it came back into the old lows, whatever that is, that it wouldn't be worthwhile. And I didn't put an IPT in there. And I'll show you another one with an IPT initial profit target in a few minutes. And so I just rolled it all day. And by the end of the day, I made $37. Now, I did do it in more than one account, but I didn't do it big in any other account. So better than the poking eye, I suppose. And again, as I said a second ago, your, your moves are going to be asymmetrical to the upside of the VIX as opposed to the implosion of the VIX. Now, every now and then you will get an implosion of the VIX, but not like the explosion type of moves. So we'll come back to trades for today. Uh, one in particular, when I'm talking about the burning dogs. And I want to talk about last week at ChartCon. It was a pretty amazing event. No, it wasn't pretty amazing. It was amazing. And I got to, to know some new friends here. I got to hang out with Ralph Afkapoor. He's an absolute trip. Hung out with Martin Pring and all the rest of these guys. And just really, really good uh, good bunch of people. And back here, this is Chip Anderson. He's the CEO of StockCharts.com. I guess he's the owner, too. Anyway, a couple of things I picked up on. And once I get a chance to and get the link and on and go back and watch everybody's presentations in full, then I can give you more on what was said and, and maybe I can learn a little bit from that too. But a lot of this is from private conversations and bits and pieces of different segments. But Larry Williams is super bullish and I didn't see everything, but one of the things he did was he was uh, showing the research of, it was actually somebody else's research of the bullishness or years ending in two or bullish. And I'm thinking to myself, he might be right but early and i think you need some sort of trigger some price-based trigger other than the fact that the market's still going down and you start nibbling on the way down i think i think that's a bad idea i have incredible respect for larry williams though pretty amazing guy pretty amazing individual and uh he's 80 years old but he's spry <laughs> he's awesome anyway it was nice getting to know him a little bit there uh you know most of these years did okay now, keep in mind, this is a monthly chart and go back to, let's say, the 50s. If you bought in 52, you would have been underwater significantly for a couple of years here by just buying in years with two. 1972 obviously would have been absolutely abysmal. I didn't measure this move lower, but that's probably 50 percent. The market's making, what, five or six year lows or even more. This is a monthly chart. But you can see, as a general statement, it tends to work, and it hasn't worked so well so far this year. You'd be down about 30% so far. So maybe use this as something ancillary to what you're doing, and, and maybe this will turn out to be a huge longer-term secular bull market, and, and what we just saw was a bit of a correction. But for me, I'm going to need to see some sort of turn. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk about the hourly chart. And we'll take a look at what's happening there. But anyway, this is a piece of his uh, research or analysis that he did. And uh, he's bullish. And I think he's right, but I think he's early. Now, Greg Schnell is bullish on Bitcoin. Greg and I were in a bull bear debate. I took the, you know, when they when they went into this, they uh, they encouraged us to take an uncomfortable side and play the other side. And I said, I, I can't do it. So I, I bull a bear and Bitcoin, like, can I pick sideways? They're like, no. I was like, all right, I'll be the bear. And, and Greg agreed to be the bull. And it turns out Greg is a little bit of a bull. But when I asked him, and I think this might have come up in the presentation. So if you guys have the recordings to this, uh, maybe check it out. We'll see how it went. And first chance I get, once I get the link, obviously, I'll see how I did. You know, you want these things feeling great. I hope I don't look at it like, oh, God, what an idiot. But when talking about them personally, he's like, well, he's not going to rush out and buy it right now. 
but he's going to look at the S&P 500 as a trigger. A little bit of intermarket analysis, but I think more than intermarket analysis, one thing that he said to me is that the S&P is going to be like a measure of risk on, risk off. So when you start seeing money coming in the S&P 500, then take a look at Bitcoin. So let me show you where I'm going with that. I've showed this chart a few times before. There's Greg. And you can see that there's a pretty good correlation between Bitcoin and the S&P 500. Got some nice Halloween colors on here. Bitcoin's in orange and the S&P 500 is in black. And here's one of the bummers, you know, all the all the proponents for or fans, is that the right word, proponents, but all the people who are who are jazzed about Bitcoin are like, "Oh, it's inflation hits, we're going to have Bitcoin. Stock market crash, we're going to have Bitcoin." Well, guess what? The market goes down, Bitcoin goes down, okay? Now, true, in recent times, Bitcoin just kind of based out when uh, the stock market took off and then imploded. So there was a little bit of decoupling there. But as a general statement, they do move in the same direction. So I think Greg's on to something here as far as the intermarket technical analysis, but more importantly, looking at it from a risk on, risk off perspective. And so that was in the back of my head today. And I've been thinking since these markets are correlated, even before I talked to Greg, that Bitcoin, because they're so correlated, that a lot of times I'm, I'm looking at S&P futures rallying, I'll go in and pick up a little Beto just for shits and giggles and ride that out too. Like if I'm buying futures, I'll look at Bitcoin and uh, Beto that is, and see if it, it triggers me in as opposed to going into the cash market and trading that, just because I've got that all on one platform, I could do it all on my stock account. And I'll show you a, a, a Bitcoin trade in just one second. Okay, Paul says, will Bitcoin react the same or opposite with gold, silver? I don't know. Uh, you know, right now, so far, we've been in kind of a liquidation market for quite a while. Gold's gone down, bonds have gone down. Bitcoin's going down and everything else is going down for the most part. Energy's kind of hung in there. They got a little wide and loose. They started going down for a while, but they're coming back a little bit. And we'll look at those markets in just one second. So I'm not sure how gold and silver are going to factor into all this. It's only just recently that gold has begun to take off. And I like what Larry Williams said a while back. It's like they keep telling you on television and radio how great gold is but they sure do want your dollars for their gold and i find that interesting every time I put on a radio on the way to the gym in the morning believe it or not i do go to the gym every day <laughs> uh, i just like to eat uh but anyway it's it's amazing how they just they're just telling you how great gold's going to be well as i said a while back and having dinner with my father i was like why would they sell it to you it's like uh, you know because they're making a profit but he kept repeating that and and it made some sense in that, hey, they're, uh, you know, why would they sell it to me if, if gold's gonna, gonna go so much higher? Now, back then, gold was at it higher. All right, Jeff says, gold has been doing the opposite of the dollar. Yeah, and we'll take a look at the dollar in one second. The dollar has been the dog with the least fleas and out of all the currencies, and it's been headed higher, I guess, because it's still a reserve currency. Thank God, I suppose. But yeah, the dollar's strength will obviously put pressure on Bitcoin if you see Bitcoin as a currency. And in fact, right here, it's Bitcoin versus what? USD. Aha, there you go, right there. So the dollar is sort of the denominator in this equation. And, and that's certainly putting pressure, absolutely, good point, on, on these markets. And intermarket technical analysis can be a wonderful thing it only works when it works. So you have to know when it's working or recognize when it's working. It's kind of like the VIX. The VIX only works when it works, but when it works, it could work very nicely. So there's a lot of a lot of different relationships to pay attention to. Except recently they were moving together for a few days. Yeah, they will decouple. And and many, 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 many years ago, I'd say maybe the mid-90s. 
you could look at one market and do that intermarket analysis. And I was working with a with a fund that traded bonds, and uh, more specifically bond options. And we noticed that the intermarket analysis only matters mattered when it mattered, and that was a, a great lesson for me that you that you don't have these exact relationships. What should happen and what actually does happen are often two different things. But hey, you know what? That's why we're trend followers, and it's like okay, the dollar is uh, doing what's doing its thing, and Bitcoin's doing just the opposite, and those two are or 100% negatively correlated. Okay, well let's pay attention to that relationship, but just realize, realize that every now and then they decouple. So absolutely good, uh, good point on on that. Now, while I was having a few beers with Martin Pring and a few of the other guys, we got to talking about trends, and I showed him my trend founder, my trend time, my trend finder. And Martin Pring said I was well armed for the markets. And so that was pretty excited with my uptrend, downtrend, and sideways arrows. That's kind of a pinch me moment hanging out with Martin Pring and then saying I was well armed for the market. So that was pretty exciting. I am a nerd. Yes, I am. <laughs> Another thing I picked up on just in brief conversations with people and some somewhat lengthy conversations with people is psychology is king. Somebody was telling me about this this day trader and they were amazed because he was pulling this money out of the market consistently. And you're probably thinking, boy, I wish I had his methodology. And it, it, it wasn't his methodology so much as his psychology. And we were just talking about the way he did what he did and how impressed we were with that. And I think that, that everyone, once you learn a little bit about technical analysis, we're all kind of on the same playing field. I'm not like blown away by anybody else in technical analysis. I mean, I'm a fan of some of these guys and I think what they did is amazing and, and, and such, but I feel like it's, it's, Hey, it's, it's going up, it's going down, it's going sideways, learn how to pick the best of the best stocks or the best of the best markets. And yeah, again, to beat the dead horse, uh, wait until that money's lying in the corner and all these other things that, but the bottom line is psychology is king. And, I was talking with one trader and he said he was having a bad week and he couldn't figure out what the hell he was doing wrong. And then I guess Friday night or whatever, I'm embellishing a little bit, but Friday night, imagine that, me embellished. But Friday night, he uh, he's having a beer, relaxing or whatever, and it dawned on him. He had to make a $40,000 tuition payment for his one of his kids on Monday or both of his kids, whatever the case may be. And in the back of his head, all week long, he was probably trying to make up some of that money. Now, my tuition payments are much lower than that, thank God. But as I've said before, I, I, you know, I always, every time I walk in the house, my office is, is part of the main house now, but it's a separate entrance. There's only one way in and out. And there's a little walkway between me and the house just to keep work separate from home. But anyway, it's, it seems like every time I walk in the house, I get hit with a bill. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we changed insurance plans. We're going to save a thousand miles. Yay, I'm going to tell all my friends. And, you know, a few weeks later, oh, you know, I had to have this procedure. And turns out it's not covered. It's like, oh. <laughs> so those pressures are always there. And that's one thing that I'm always talking about doing is identify what things that have nothing to do with trading that are affecting your trading and you know we always need money but sometimes you need more than others and that can affect your trading so anyway that's another thing that really came up over the weekend quite a bit is how important trading psychology is all right any questions so far yeah we'll get to those uh lauren when we get to the live charts i hope you can stay up long enough what time is it over there it's probably uh three in the morning maybe 14 hours probably difference Okay, it seems like your two major intraday setups are the VIX trade and ogres. Well, not not really. That's what I'm that's what I'm sort of showing you now. Okay, like today. Well, I guess it was kind of an ogre. I did uh, Soxl and LabD. It didn't print a lot of money. I made more than I made in the VIX. But uh, the VIX, the the ogre is something that 
I think is very repeatable. Okay. If I talk about, oh, it's 9 30. Yeah, you're you're fine. Uh if I, I thought it was like 4 a.m. I was all excited that you'd wake up at four to watch me. But um one reason I talk about ogres in these presentations is it's repeatable. So some of this this firing off of these intraday trades might not be repeatable and teachable, at least not as much as, as something like the like the ogre. And uh if you look at the back end of the website, there's all the Q and A's. I get more questions on new opening gap reversals than anything. And, and ideally, you want to trade those with the trend, as I'm going to show you right now, in a big, fat, thick stock, something like AMD or AMAT or something like that, or especially like a, a Wall Street darling or something that a lot of institutions are in, and look to play that opening gap reversal in the direction of trend. So it's not just the VIX. And the yogurt is the VIX lately, just because I want to show you my research and how I'm beginning to trade that VIX on an intraday basis. The beauty of the VIX trading is, and I haven't figured out a filter for everything else. And if you go in and look at some of the trading quick clips on YouTube, youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry trick quick clips for the playlist, you'll see that I did spend a lot of time kind of going down that rabbit hole of trying to figure out when the best day trades occur or the intraday trades, I should say. The good thing with the VIX is the VIX itself will tell you by waiting for it to get stretched to go in and look to play that reversion to the mean move. So that's one reason I'm sharing that it's repeatable. The ogre stuff is also very repeatable, especially if you're trading in the direction of the trend in those big cat stocks. Okay. Okay, it seems like your two major interest rate setups are VIX trades and ogres. How do you manage your attention when both are firing off? Well, one thing I've been doing real a lot lately is trying not to watch every flickering tick. And I borrowed that from Dave Keller. I think he got it from Todd Harrison. And this morning, for instance, I took a break and I went in a garage for a little while. After I saw what was happening on the opening, I, I set a bunch of alerts and I said, Dave, if you sit here and watch it, you're going to fire off trades. It's going to suck you in and spit you out. So I actually went in the garage for a few minutes, chilled out a little bit, and then I was going to have breakfast. And uh, I was interrupted by a bunch of alerts. So I came in and this is when you know the VIX trade uh, triggered or I put that on or whatever. So the way you have your focus is you don't watch every tick. And one thing I was telling one of the fellow traders over the weekend, and because he was asking me about sort of like a um, kind of like the Russian dolls with time frames, like look at a three minute chart. He knows I'm a big fan of the 15, but what about a three minute chart for confirmation? And I think he's on to something, but my big fear there is I would end up chasing my own tail. And I told him that one of the things that that I have and I have identified and I actually put in my trading journal when it occurs is I call it the one minute warning. If I am looking at a 15 minute chart and I decide to take a trade and all of a sudden I find myself on a one minute chart or even if I'm not taking the trade, I'm watching that market too closely. So so you have to figure out little triggers to kind of clue you in to that you're you're watching the market too closely. Now, way back, maybe last year or so when I was doing some of this intraday stuff, let's say I put on a thousand shares, kind of like I did with this veto trade, I'll show you in one second. And basically I did nothing with this trade today, but put in an order, put in one order, uh, take that back, put in one, three orders. And that was all done within the first hour or so of trading. And you'll see the trades here in just one second. And I literally went about my life and I started working on these slides here, and doing other things, answering some emails, serving the internet a little bit. I mean, all these, you know, that's a problem. You get, you got all these monitors. Could be six. I got five up and running now. <laughs> you know, you got to be careful. All the clickbait out there and, and such. And plus, I upload my YouTube videos. But anyway, you have to really be cognizant of, of not getting sucked into it. And one thing that I've been writing about lately is... Ed Sakota once said, having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine and you're going to want to feed it. But, you know, I don't think you should be watching a screen, although I do have a lot of screens that I watch way too much. Okay. 
Okay, both firing. Will we focus on one approach for the day or get pulled both if both setups look right? Well, the, the VIX trade and the Ogre trade today were sort of the same thing. Now, I, I think I see where you're going with that. One of my problems, and that's the beauty of you've got to do that trading journal. And, and you know, I'm guilty of not going back and looking at it because I know what my faults are. <laughs> But I really should go back in and look at it. And, and I was talking with someone else and and they were talk, telling me about the, the way they fire off their day trades and, and they're doing institutional stuff, but they're there all day and they're kind of like me. They're firing off a day trade here and there. They've noticed different things happen in the market as the, as the volatility is expanding in the markets, they tend to do okay. And when the volatility is contracted, they, they tend to do worse. So that's, you have to find some sort of filter and believe me, I'm working on it. And that's the beauty of that VIX stuff is that that doesn't happen that much. So you're what I'm sensing you're saying is you're saying, how do you manage your attention when both are firing off? Will you focus on one approach for the day or get pulled into both if the setups look right? Well, I think I hear where you're coming from. You got to be really careful not to chase your own tail. And I have found myself long and short markets at the same time. And I'm like, what in the F? am i doing and i think ideally you want to have one direction for the day now lately it's like the, we've got the electric cardiogram going with the market and you end up chasing your own tail because you end up long then you're short you know it's kind of like jackie mason market and it's just ridiculous at the end of the day and i made a whole bunch of trades the other day in the day i was up 69 cents and it's like why did i waste all that mental energy chasing the markets now believe me if that's the worst I did, I'd be happy. I've gotten creamed a few days by chasing the market. So I think you're onto something like don't chase the market, but try to figure out if there is a direction in the works. Now, I will occasionally be short on ETF uh, via the inverse shares and long another one. I don't like when that occurs. And that's a red flag, like the market is kind of confused and be really careful. The, my best trading comes when you have a route day, especially a, after a big reversal. So I hope I hope that's that that answers your question. But yeah, there are times when you have to really be careful not to chase your own tail. All right, let's get back to this opening gap reversal. Now, before we get into that, a little I want to talk a few words about or talk a little bit about burning dogs. And that comes from I don't know if I could reach it. Trading Sardines, which was Linda Rasky's book. Really enjoyed reading that book. Um, I actually helped Linda in the editing. I think my name is in there somewhere for helping. But uh, excellent book. And it, it's a very honest book when it comes to like trading. And, uh, you know, a lot of F-bombs in there. But she was talking about this one trader would come in and he would just do the opposite of whatever the S&P was doing. And, and, she, and uh, he, he said something about don't pet the burning dog or whatever. Like he would... It, he liked to just be the uh, be contrary and just to be contrarian is, is the gist of it. In fact, I probably should go and read it to make sure I got the stories right. But it sounded like he wanted to be contrarian just to be contrarian because nobody wants to pet the burning dog. And how that came about, I don't know. But I started calling these ogres that are against the trend. So you've got a trend straight down and then you got a gap down and then it comes back up. I started calling those burning dogs. And uh, by the way, Linda had told him, Look, just stop being so contrarian for the contrarian's sake, and why don't we model it out and let's see if there's a bit of an edge there. So ideally with these burning, with these ogres, I should say, these opening gap reversals, you want to trade in the direction of the trend. So you've got a nice trend, you got a pullback, and then all of a sudden you got a gap down. You're looking to catch it reversion back up in the direction of the trend, as opposed to a pure reversion to the mean move from a market that's stretched. However, there are cases where you might go in something like Bitcoin, an index, or a sector ETF and trade those burning dog type of setups. Ideally, though, I like to see the ogre, the open gap reversal, in the direction of trend, and ideally within a setup like a pullback. Now, somebody brought up AMAT this morning. We'll take a look at that. And I would say the general statement, you want to avoid burning dogs. And burning dogs don't make a lot of sense when I show the pattern here. 
unless it's something like a super big cap stock. And my thinking was, and we were talking about this on Facebook earlier, and uh, they watched it, didn't trade, which I think is, I'm actually more impressed that they watched it, didn't trade, than if they had just ran out and traded it. But you could see AMAT this morning had the mother of all gaps lower and then pretty much went straight up, had a route higher. Now, in a case like AMAT, if you take a look at the SOX, which we'll do in a few minutes, and the big cap stocks within the SOX, but specifically the SOX and the overall market, AMAT is such a big fat stock. It traded 14 million shares today that maybe I can make an exception for something like that, but ideally you want to trade the actual sector. And the reason I'm making an exception is because it's so thick and so big, it kind of acts like the sector itself. And, you know, maybe I'm kind of backing into something here. Maybe you could use something like AMAT to kind of help you time your uh, semi conductor trade. So as goes AMAT, so does the semis, I would imagine. But yeah, this one did work out nicely. Um, as a general statement, you don't want to be trading against the trend. You don't want to be fighting the trend. Unless, you know, you come in like today, S&P just gets washed out. And then it wasn't that easy. I took a couple of stabs at futures. It did not make money in futures today, believe it or not. But I was able to make money in the ETFs and then pick up a tiny bit in SVXY, a tiny bit in TQQQ and stuff like that. By the way, this is another thing I was talking about last week at Bandcamp with the other guys. It seems to me, and because he was he was trading, one guy in particular was trading the ETFs versus the futures. And it seems to me that it's a little bit easier to hold on to the ETFs. Now, it might be the leverage involved or whatever, but a market like the S&P futures is so damn choppy. I've been backing way off on my futures trading lately. And then, you know, just going and doing like onesies every now and then just for shits and giggles. But anyway, if you go to trade an ogre, maybe I'll make an exception for something like AMAT. You know, you can see there's a couple in here, major, major lows, little ogre back here. I'm just kind of eyeballing them. You know, this one, who knows what happened. You better got chopped up a little bit in that. But, you know, here's one that failed, okay? So they don't always work, but ideally you want them in the direction of the trend. By that, let's say this was a longer term trend. Just use your mind's eye, imagine that. And then let's say you gap to, down to here, you got a major trend, you got a pullback, and then it begins to reverse. That's a much better trend. Is it in the morning? No, it's uh, 6.30 Central Time, 6.42 Central Time here. So here's the BO. Now, BO hit an all-time low. Now, keep in mind, this is a futures contract based on the S, the Bitcoin. And this is actually a third derivative because this is a derivative of a derivative. And I don't know if Bitcoin's a derivative or not. I guess it's not. But you can see it makes all time lows. Now, obviously, it's not all time lows for Bitcoin, but it's all time lows for this contract and for the futures contract, I suppose. But by the way, I don't recommend you hold Beto overnight. If you're going to hold something, GBTC would be my go to for that. I do have a, a hot old position there. Don't tell anybody because uh, it kind of goes against <laughs> what I believe in. But I do have a tiny bit of that hot one. I do have some uh, Bitcoin on the hardware wallet. Not enough to beat me over the head with, believe me. <laughs> what they call that, the $5 wrench? Uh, just a little tiny, tiny bit just for S and Gs. So it, made, it makes all time lows, the contract at least. So it looks kind of like a washout. And... My thinking is kind of Greg Snow-esque is S, if that's the right way of saying that, but kind of like along the lines of what Greg Snow is saying, two markets are correlated. And I have noticed even before Greg pointed that out, as you'll go back, if you go back and look at prior presentations where I had the, like I did earlier with one under the other, that sometimes when the market begins to reverse, sometimes you can go in and trade something like Beto, and it might actually be a little cleaner, and you might actually be able to risk less. And, and in this Beto trade, I risked, I was going to risk 20, 10 cents initially, and I said, you know what, let me uh, widen it out to a full 20 cents. And this is what it looked like on a daily chart. Those are the trades up there. Don't worry about grabbing the screen. I'll come back to that in one second. But I just put on a thousand shares. 
not a whole lot at this level here, 1137. And I'll walk you through the trade. I flipped out my initial risk. Like I said, I only wanted to risk 10 cents. And there's a danger in that. Like, okay, 10 cents, thousand shares, hundred bucks, you know, who cares, right? But there's a danger in that. And like trading not to lose. So it's like, okay, well, I really thought I could go in and risk 10 cents on this. Once I got into it and I put that trailing stop at 10 cents, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa you got to give this thing at least twice that amount, 20 cents. Now for taking profits, and this is where you got to be careful too. It's like, well, if I take profits at 20 cents, I'm only making a hundred bucks. It's like, well, hang on, Dave. Do you think it can go further than 20 cents? It's like, yeah, I think it can go at least 30 cents higher. And that's why I put in my IPT 30 cents higher. So I took profits when that happened, partial profits, and then let the stop ride. Now, as I said earlier, I put in, I guess, four if you count the close. So I put in an entry order. And once I triggered, I put in a trailing stop, an IPT. And then once the IPT was hit, I tried to close my eyes and not look at it too much. And then at the end of the day, I just replaced that trailing stop order with a market on close. So we'll take a look at that. So again, as I was asked earlier, I deleted the question, I forget who asked it, uh, but they were asking about, about your focus and, and and I think they were talking more along the lines of what if two different things are happening at the same time? How do you pick one? But as far as the the intraday stuff, I don't want to watch a screen all day. When I saw watching that screen, I could feel it right now. My shoulder starts to clench up a little bit. You know, now my fingers are going numb. So just kind of a hot mess. So I don't want to push you guys into day trading unless, of course, it's a money lying in the corner situation. And believe me, I'm working on that. But in this case, all I did was I put in a stop entry order and I put in an IPT for 30 cents higher, 20 cents trailing stop because look, we enter at, let's say we get in here around round numbers around 40 cents, you know, drop it down 20 cents, we're way back here. So this market should not turn around and go and, and go all the way back in. So flipped out half at 30 cents. Now, I usually have one for one on this. So if I'm risking half a point, flip it out at half a point, trail it at a half a point. Now, sometimes on that second loaf, especially if the market really starts moving in my favor, I'll open that up a little bit more, kind of like we do in those longer term swing trades. I know I've beaten a horse on the ARLP, which I la which is a last long that triggered in 2021, early 2021, recommended in 2020, triggered in 2021. And we're still holding on because we've got that widening stop in there. So by all means, be willing to widen that stop out a little bit, that trailing stop, open it up a little bit and to see what happens. But anyway, flipped out half there. And then I did 500 market on close. So again, there's the trades down there. And this one's a little bit better than that VIX trade, 150 bucks on the first loaf, 174 in the second for a gain of 324. Which is better than the polka dot. If you could, if you could do that every day, I know my wife makes fun of me when I do this annualization thing. That's over seventy five thousand dollars extra a year if you could go and find this money line in the corner type of trade. Which I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is the best trade in the world, but I figured it was worth a shot. The money line in the corner, I think, would be more like a we're in a longer term bull market and a company is pulling back or making like a TKO and then. They come out with bad earnings or ideally something that's that's not so tangible, some kind of bad news. And then that, that stop gaps lower on that news. And then people by the end of the day or, or early in the trading, it becomes a bit of a shoulder shrug and everybody rushes back in to the trade. But anyway, this is what I did here. And it, it was a fairly low risk trade and it turned out OK for me. OK, Jeff says, how do you set your buy points on ogres? Like Vito, when it does not gap, drop, then come back up. See Riot today. Okay, remind me when we get to the live charts, we'll take a look at Riot. You know, and that's a good idea. It's something I didn't think about doing was there was so much to look at today. I didn't think about looking at the Crypto Sisters to see what they were doing. That's that's pretty smart, Jeff. I'm impressed. And that's why I need to probably need to pay more attention to uh, to Facebook, although I was in there quite a bit today in my Facebook group. Um, well, one thing I would encourage you to do, and let's back this chart up a little bit. 
is, let me just take all this writing out of here. If you're looking at the little, remember I talked about the one minute warning earlier. If you're looking at the chart intraday, you gotta be really careful not to, you gotta be careful to see the forest for the trees, okay? Because you're up like this, and, and that little one minute move or even a 15 minute move is gonna look like it's this huge bar, okay? And sometimes I make the mistake of zooming in too far and then the bars look not only this big, but it's that big and it looks like the market's going to the moon. Well, one thing I do on one monitor, I keep all the ETFs on a daily basis. And if I get all hot and bothered looking at them over here in the trading station, I'll come over here where I am now. And this is the computer I do all my analysis on. And I'll look at the, those ETFs on an intraday basis. And if I'm doing something in individual stock, I'll look at that too. And I'm sorry, on a daily basis, I keep daily charts up. So I look at the daily chart. So to make sure I'm not chasing my own tail, because early in the morning, this thing rallies up to 20 cents or 30 cents or whatever. And it's looking like it's just going to the moon, but then it starts backing and filling. Okay. Aha. I almost got caught in the break, uh, fake out there. So you need to make sure you're looking at the daily chart and I don't have an exact entry point on these ogres. And yeah, sometimes you can go in and it's right on the open, it's the best time to trade them. But I like to let them get moving a little bit. And my favorite ogres, and if you go in and watch as many weekly charts as you can stand, you'll see that they show up every now and then, every so often back during the bull market days. But you got a stock that gaps open, rallies up a little bit, implodes, and then you're like, aha. I got you, okay? And that's where I think it was how someone earlier is like, how do you focus? Well, my focus is I put my entry right above that high or right you know, right, right below that high of the day. And a lot of times I'll never get triggered. The stock would just keep it imploding, but I don't care. I keep on imploding. Now, maybe if the base is out late in the day, two o'clock or an hour before the close for uh, three o'clock Eastern, two o'clock my time, maybe late in the day, you get this late day rallies. Maybe I'll I'll play that late day breakout and then stop out at the low of the day. Okay. So you see what I mean about ogres? It's like there's so many questions, but go in and watch those. Uh you you have access to the back end. So go in and watch the QA, all the QA we did on ogres, and then of course the YouTube channel after that. Okay, how do you buy, buy points on ogres like Beto when it does not gap, drop, and then come back up? See Riot today. The buy point seems obvious and Riot, but not Beto. Well, okay, opening gap, uh, that's kind of like a la Toby Crable, okay? So it's like, okay, well, we got an opening gap. It's rallying, it's rallying, it's rallying. I'm going to jump in, right? And this thing might just fake out. And then all of a sudden, I saw this move here. Like, okay, I feel a little bit better now. And then I started breaking out. And I don't know exactly when I placed the order, but it probably was, it was well before 11 o'clock. I placed the order up here somewhere, give it some wiggle room. And when I saw it implode, I'm like, okay, what's well, probably not going to trigger. So I went about my life. And later in the day, I heard zing. And then later in the day, I heard another zing when it hit that IPT. So hopefully that makes some sense. When it does not gap drop and then come back up. Yeah, that's the ideal. Gap drop then comes up but not Beto. Okay. Well, we'll take a look at Riot. So he says it looks a lot more obvious in Riot. So Toby Crable did an opening gap, uh, opening rage breakout book years ago. It's a it's, um, very rare book. It's like three or $4,000. Um, but you might be able to find it out there somewhere or the gist of it. But the gist of it is he looked to play these opening breakouts of these ranges and some of the ogre stuff is similar to that. So you know, just wait to see if you get a little bit of a base, wait to see if you get a couple of fake outs and then put your entry in above those highs. And then every now and then, guess what? You're going to buy the absolute freaking high of the market. It, spell it a silent SH, happens. I thought Riot dropped enough through the gap, open buying, it came back up through the open price, it's fairly safe, gave you a good stop. Well, yeah, beautiful, Jeff. All right, we're going to look at that. That that makes a lot of sense. I think that's what I was trying to explain here. and It's going to work out great to have that. Uh, just real quick, last week we talked about hourly patterns. I know one of the guys in the group does a lot of work on the hourly charts and he'll get out of the market when it begins to roll over an hourly basis. I'm a little slower to get out because I don't want to get whipsawed too much. 
but I hear where he's coming from. And oh, by the way, on my individual stock positions, I do not get out. Okay, I ride them out. And as I said last week, a week before, I guess, something like ARLP, without that one trade, I probably wouldn't be having a fantastic year. I'm not having a fantastic year. I don't think I'm having that great of a year, but I would not be well into the black this year if it weren't for that one trade because it's up, or at least was up, 77% for the beginning of the year. So that's helped out tremendously. Anyway, a market's going to turn on hourly before it'll turn on daily. And of course, it'll turn on a 15 minute before it'll turn on an hourly, but it's already turned on the 15, by the way. But that might be a little too, you're getting a little too close. I mean, you start, you're starting to see the trees and you're forgetting to see the forest when that happens. But it is interesting. Look at these moving averages here based, with, based on today's action. They need to come together here quickly, okay? So we'll see what happens, but we'll pay attention to that and I'll pay and I'll let you know what I see. All right, let's hop into crypto real quick. Well, I'm going to just spend a few minutes here unless you want to spend a little bit longer. And then um, I'll clean up, uh, do a little cleanup, get, all, get done with all these questions. And of course, we'll take a look at the overall market. Uh, remember last week, this time I'm not at Bandcamp, or two weeks. I keep saying last week. Uh, last week I was at Bandcamp. <laughs> I was at uh, Chartcom. But the week before that, I talked about you need to do your analysis every day, even though it might not come to anything. And so back here, so I guess it was three weeks ago, I saw this little breakout in uh, C-pool. Now, in general, I'm a pullback player, but sometimes in these cryptos and uh, Forex, back when I traded Forex, I'd look to trade breakouts. And you see you got the Landry light here and a nice little breakout. So I got in at 70 cents or something, flipped it out 30 cents higher, rolled it up, and then I was bummed out when I was, I didn't check it until I raised my stop a little bit, but I forgot to check it. And I was telling somebody about crypto and they weren't trading. I'm like, oh man, it's crazy sometimes. Take a look at the C pool. I'm like, oh my goodness, it had already imploded quite a bit. But I did get stopped out of small profit on the remainder. So that trade is done. And go in and, and watch the prior presentations if you get really, really bored. I can't sleep at night. Bitcoin, cash, you can see nice tail lower today. Okay, it's open 24 hours. You're not going to get the gaps. And a nice little reversal but the trend is still down. And so far I remain bearish overall in Bitcoin, although it's trying to bottom out in here. And I hope, I know you should never use the word hope, but I hope it goes higher, but right now, not so much. And then Ethereum, just take a look at that, unless there's some other ones you guys want to look at. Ethereum had a nice little tail lower today, coming back nicely, not quite these major lows in here, but bouncing a little bit. Let's take a look just real quick. As I've said, a nauseam, a while back, last fall in particular, you see something like this PHNX. If if I was in the middle of this webinar last fall, and if you go to watch some of those, you'll see it, I would buy this right now if, it, if it's liquid enough. You know, S and G size, maybe a thousand bucks or something like that. But you know, these things run up if you got a 20% profit target. So, you know, you make it a hundred bucks or so, and then you trail on a stop higher. I guess you'd make 100 bucks. But that's better than the poke in the eye. But some of these things you can see kind of taking off in here. When they all start taking off again, or a, a plethora of them begin to take off, then they might be worth trading again. But as I've said quite a bit, all I would do back then is go in and buy the strongest ones. Ethereum name service. I made a lot of money on this once. No idea what it does. I have no idea what none of them do. <laughs> Frenchy hope. There's no hope in trading. <laughs> There's no crying in baseball. All right, let's shift gears and then uh, finish up these questions and take a look at the overall market. All right, let's do this. Let's uh, go to. But yeah, you know, continue to do your homework because maybe something's waking up and worthwhile. You know, now you know you got me thinking. I want to go buy some of that uh, <laughs> whatever that stupid thing was. Uh, let me just take a look at that riot thing real quick, and then you guys can start asking about individual stocks, and I'll get through the market quickly. Okay, so Jeff said that it was kind of cut and dry here in riot. Let's take a look at 50 minutes. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so I bet if you looked at a one minute chart, you might have chased your own tail, but notice that you've got the gap lower. Looks like you got a little bit of fake out higher, then it imploded. So that's what I was trying to say earlier. Like, aha. So if I could put in an order above this high, and damn it, I wish I had a seen this 
if you talked about it in a group, I'm going to be mad because I didn't, I wasn't paying attention that close. But yeah, that that opening range and the first five minute bars was pretty much a fake out. And then, like I said, go to the 15 minute bars, which I now use and I use by accident, as I've said before. And then all of a sudden, I'm making fewer and fewer trades. Like, wow, it's just not a whole lot of trades for some reason. It's because I'm looking at a 15 minute chart, not a five minute chart. Okay. I thought Rye dropped enough below the gap that buying it as it came back through the open price was fairly safe and gave me a good stop of the low. Yeah, I like the way you think. I mean, I would have given it probably a tiny bit more room, but yeah, I hear you. So he's saying that, okay, I'm going to buy it right above this high as it comes back through. Now, what I was saying earlier is let's say this thing sells off fairly hard. Then you could put an order like right here because the whole world's going to be looking to get in above that high. But yeah, you know, nicely played, man. I wish I'd have seen that. I would have been all over that, I think. Let me just take a look at the daily chart, though. Yeah, that's pretty, eh. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I like I like the 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 veto because it, it, at contract lows, I probably would not have taken that trade, but it does look, I see what you're seeing. It does look pretty good. And here's the thing, okay? If this was on my screen, I probably would have taken it, okay? but just looking at this, like if I was looking at this on a daily chart, it's like, well, it's not gapping down to, to these all-time lows back here. And then again, too, you know, I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth. I don't recommend you trade burning dogs and individual issues, but in a case like this, you know it's going to trade in tandem with the crypto. So maybe anytime you're in crypto, take a look at Riot and Mara and see if there's anything worth uh, trading there. Thoughts on short-term CDs? I have no idea. I try to stay away from any fixed income uh, stuff. Is it is that what you mean by CD? Certificate of deposit? Is that what they even call? Yeah, I need it. I I wish I was better in that, but there's there's other people that are much better than me that chase that fixed income. Just not my forte. All right, S&P 500, nice little opening gap reversal. Felt like the whole world was coming unglued this morning. You know, that's when you got to keep your head while everybody else is, is losing theirs. It helps only having one long on, that aforementioned ARLP. That makes life a lot easier. But I wouldn't, you know, let's not start kissing each other just yet. Uh, wait for at least an hourly bow tie before getting kind of excited in here. Let's just see if we can get some follow through. Now, my gut is that... I've been watching this, as I mentioned, in, uh, you know, last time <laughs> earlier and Facebook. In the Facebook group earlier, I mentioned that I've been watching this uh, GameStop saga. Uh, I think it's called Eat the Rich on Netflix, and I'm watching it. Don't don't tell me what happens, although I did trade through that whole thing. Uh, I did a lot of options trading around it, but um, I'm only getting to see like 10 minutes at a time because it's my wife's not incredibly interested in it, and it's also a lot of explaining and all. and and of course, I have to talk through it because then I get all excited and feel like I have to explain it. So it just doesn't work when we watch market related things. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I've been watching it 10 minutes at a time, 10 minutes at breakfast, 10 minutes at lunch. But one thing that it reminded me of is that shorts are very egotistical. And I think that the shorts and the game stock felt like the stock was going to zero, no need to cover. We're just going to write it down. And every now and then we're going to pile on a little bit more. And That'll work until it don't, until you have some sort of outlier event. And this was a, uh, I don't, I wouldn't know how many standard deviations, but probably like a 10 standard deviation event that they never could have seen. And I remember being blown away when these phone traders came in and threw all that volatility into the market. And it was fantastic, you know, but as they started blowing up, the volatility dried up and, you know, maybe I'm getting back to that but it was working so well. The, the intraday stuff works so damn well. I have 10 contracts, eight puts on Riot, so I felt pretty safe. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I got you. All right, so you had some puts and you traded against your puts. Yeah, you know, you, you end up with a lot of moving parts. And you got to be careful with that. And that's, I did a lot of that in GameStop, okay? I would go in and buy a put or puts, and then I'd go in and buy shares and have the puts in the shares and you know but you could end up chasing your own tail and you got to like somebody was saying earlier you, you end up both kind of long and short and you're not sure which way you want the market to go and that just reminds you know my shoulder's hurting just talking about it and my fingers are going numb 
you know, so you got to be careful not to chase your own tail and you can't be, you can't be in two places at once. What was that movie playing God? He was up and down at the same time with his, with his drug abuse. So you find yourself in two places at one time, which is not a good thing. Bonds, which way are Bonds headed? Anybody know? Anybody want to draw an arrow for me? Down. Bonds, bonds down, rates up. Speaking of up, UUP, the dollar, got hit a little bit today. That probably helped Bitcoin, Bitcoin out a bit. But uh, so far, a nice little upturn remains intact in the dollar. Most sectors look a lot like the P's. We're getting kind of in the in a little bit later stages of the bear market where everything's kind of selling off and looking like that. NASDAQ deposit, same sort of action there too. Notice in all these indices, by the way, as I've been saying at nauseum, especially in the trading service, we're right here at these multi-year lows, lowest levels since 2020. Remember, these aren't just little squiggles on the charts. These are actual trades. So anybody who bought stocks in late 2000, and 20 is now underwater, okay, losing money. And that could put a little pressure, especially think about what's happening now. And I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but technical analysis is, is looking at the charts. And you'd have to imagine that these people are feeling pressure, especially with the inflation and everything else that's going on. But anyway, NASDAQ composite trend still remains down. Hopefully, a word you should never use again. There's no hope in trading. <laughs> but hopefully, we'll see something more than a one-day wonder. That remains to be seen. I've been a little bullish on gold, but I might change my tune soon here. There's a few gold stocks I still like. We have one going into tomorrow that might be worthwhile. We've been looking at one, as you know, for a week or so. Never did trigger, so moving on from that. But gold looks like it's trying to bottom out. Nice little thrust from those, a little deep pullback, nice little opening gap reversal today. But let's see, okay? You got to really take a, a, a show me approach. Energy's had a bang up day, as you can see, not too far from this little peak, which is not too far from the all time highs peak. You know me, I like to see all time highs before getting too excited. Either that or a market go down to major lows, like gold bottom out and then begin to come off the lows. But, you know, let's not start kissing each other just yet in gold. If the gold stock triggers that we're looking at, then it triggers. If not, then I'll leave it alone. Banks had, had the mother of all opening gap reversals today. They did find a little support at the recent lows. Big blue arrows still pointing down there. Financials, as I've been saying, and nausea look like the overall market, right? Pretty serious downtrend and tat. Biotech had a decent rally today. It didn't, didn't blow the roof off, but up a couple percent here. But it's wide and loose and kind of sideways. And let me just show you a couple of tech areas. No need to go through all these, but you can see like software, open a gap reversal down toward multi-year lows, kind of like the overall market itself, especially the NASDAQ. And, you know, notice that software is all the way back to the summer of 2020. Okay. Hi, Dave. I'm not working today, so delighted to listen to your show. Well, thank you, Lauren. I appreciate you here, you being here. I'm interested in your thoughts on AAG, trend following, and an ELF, CEIX, more swing trade. All right, let's open it up for individual stocks, of course. AG, AG is the gold stock. It's a little wide and loose. You know, it, gold and especially silvers can be a little tricky. Commodity related stocks, he tried to say. You, you have to be a little bit more lenient with your patterns, okay? So occasionally you'll see like Dave, that doesn't look like a stock you'd pick. Well, I'm kind of give I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. So you're hitting major lows. Ideally, you want all-time lows. The one we had a couple of days ago, going into yesterday, was at all-time lows. Coming into today, I should say, it didn't trigger. Ideally, you want all-time lows, but we're at multi-year lows, so that's okay. So again, being a little lenient, kind of bottoming out in here, nice thrust higher sort of bow tie looking so I, I do like that ag i think it's okay it looks like it's made a transition um you're on a service we'll take a little one on a service i like that one a little bit better and then i like the eqx even better but it didn't trigger elf looks okay one thing i've been talking about quite a bit is let's say we do bottom out in this market okay well what's going to happen is institutions are going to start buying 
value or perceived value or stocks at low levels, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. And where are they going to get that money? Well, let's say somebody's been holding on to ELF forever. They're going to dump their ELF. So a super bullish stock in a bear market will often become a source of funds when the market turns. So that's my only problem. I think um, there's one of them that I've been following lately. AZPN is another one of those. Looks pretty nice, a little bit deeper pullback. I might trade this on a deeper pullback, but it scares me that this is kind of like the last of the Mohicans type of deal, and it could become a source of funds. So that's my big concern there. And CEIX, more of a swing trade. CEIX. Yeah, I'm not really seeing this as a, uh, what's the Aussie man say? Yeah, nah. Uh, if it makes new highs and pulls back, maybe. This one's on my momentum list, but uh, it's not set up at this juncture, okay? So yeah, yeah, yes, I'll give you one out of three for those. Yes to AG, it's not beautiful, but it is a silver stock, so we've got to give it a bit of a, a little leeway on that. Okay, any more questions? You're welcome, Lauren, anytime, buddy. All right, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, all you guys and girls, I'll see you tomorrow in Facebook. I'll be checking in quite a bit there. Everybody else, enjoy your weekend, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.